Once you've got a useless bull bar, nothing says bush bashing bogan quite as loud as fitting a snorkel to one's 4x4. The better to enhance its capabilities for those extreme trips to the shops or dropping the fat brats at school. Hashtag Australia. Snorkels are a joke 99.9% of the time. And here's why. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just, you know, click the card up there now, dude. Now look, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay, bolting accessories to one's 4x4 can be kind of fun. It gets you out of the house, but let's face it, not too far from the fridge. And you can appear to be gainfully occupied, both of which are quite important. And if we're all honest with one another momentarily, who hasn't wanted to take a ginormous hole saw vengefully to the front mud guard? I know I have, but usually on other people's cars, like that friggin' S-Class, parked in a no-stopping zone. Bastard. I would whole saw the shit out of that in a heartbeat any day of the week ending in Y. <laughs> Where were we? We Australians do love our off-roaders, don't we? Hilux was the top-selling vehicle in all of Shitsville last year. Again. Ranger was next. Again. And Triton came in at number seven and Prado after that. They're all hardcore off-roaders after all. Like, dude, if Bonds is not managing to sell a metric shit ton of pre-faded blue singlets every month, there is something seriously buggy about the source code for this version of the Matrix, isn't there? And I get all these questions about friggin' snorkels. Go figure. I had one last night. So let us myth bust the crap out of that, shall we? If you're in the aftermarket industry, you're going to hate this. And, hey, hopefully, me. Up front, number one with a bullet, the only epistemologically objective justification that I can give you for fitting a snorkel is this, all right? You want to drive through really, really deep water without destroying the engine, important caveat. Meaning, water deeper than the official wading depth of your vehicle, which is in the handbook, dude. This is a very Albie Mangles undertaking too, it must be said. Like, a Ranger has an official wading depth of 800 millimeters. That's pretty friggin' deep, especially if it's flowing. Okay, good safety tip. Try not to drive through cross-flowing water because downstream, not fun. If you are a water-driving virgin, dude, it works like this. Driving through water should be a weapon of last resort, like of necessity. <sighs> but some chaps think it's fun, and I can't tell you why. Engines are meant to suck air, obviously. The air inlet in your engine, at least in a 4x4, is in the front guard or under the bonnet up the top at the front, commonly. If you breach the handbook's operating limits and drive into sufficiently deep water and submerge the air inlet, it's all kinds of fun because the engine sucks water. That's not meant to happen. Water is incompressible inconveniently, so if you get water in the combustion chamber at, I don't know, 2,000 RPM or something, the valves are going to close and then... The piston, which is expecting a nice soft cushion of squishy air, is going to slam instead into a wall of incompressible water. Deafening silence to follow. This in the trade is called an hydraulic lock or an hydro lock, and it's going to cost you like ballpark 15 grand or something because it bends the crank and the rods and it otherwise opens the entire book of revelation inside your engine, which is generally bad. So the snorkel is basically an elevated air intake designed to mitigate this risk. And if you are a full-on blue singlet adventurer <laughs> with a lifetime all seasons pass to Dingo Piss Creek, okay, dude, fit one, approved. You might actually need this. For everyone else, though, 
What an emphatic waste of cash. The aftermarket industry, so keen to tell you this will not affect your warranty. But I suggest if you do fit a snorkel and then you drive into deep water and hydro lock your engine, forget all about a warranty claim from the car maker. They're simply going to say, dude, kindly refer to page 453, waiting depth. You exceeded it, that'll be like 22 grand, including fitting and GST. Will that be cash or defibrillator? You might be able to come after the aftermarket dudes, but you would have to prove the product was defective or that the installation was, like, good luck with that. Ultimately, it could prove to be a pretty damn expensive creek crossing. Like, you could have hired a friggin' helicopter for that. The one advantage of having the dealer fit a genuine snorkel, right, for consumer law purposes, you'll be coming after the dealer for warranty and or consumer law issues, whether it be the accessory or the car. One-stop shop. You won't have two competing parties, each desperately trying to brush you off onto the other one. See, this is the bit where I've really had a gutful of the 4x4 aftermarket industry and its seemingly bullshit claims, which they appear to be unafraid to make over and over and over. These are perpetuated, of course, by so-called journalists who have no idea or who are operating in a system dripping in bad incentives where industry criticisms are simply not tolerated because the audience does not come first. Speaking of which, here is an appalling piece, personal opinion, from which car. Which car is very confused about its online identity because sometimes it identifies as 4x4 Australia, and sometimes as wheels, and sometimes as motor. I guess we can just rely on the fact that it really means it's dependably irrelevant. 4x4 Snorkel Buyer's Guide. Yes, there's a definitive resource. A class of report that I would categorise broadly as advertiser suck piece, which works like this because I have written quite a few in the past before I kind of did this and burnt every conceivable bridge. Not talking about that. Works like this, okay? You, the publisher, gives, let's call it, a reporter, a list of advertisers or potential advertisers that you'd like to appease. A so-called reporter runs a few unauthenticated quotes, doesn't ask any hard questions, and industry dudes get to see their names in print. They sell a few snorkels, hopefully, and the wheels are greased thereby to open the ad schedule checkbook. <laughs> yes, this is how the legacy media still rolls. Amazingly. On a standard vehicle setup, the air intake is usually in the inner wheel arch or under the bonnet. The air from these locations is not always the best as the air can be affected by external elements such as dust, heat or water. That's a quote from Iron Man's product director Adam Craze. Not the Marvel one, okay? The Australian one. Totally agreed, Adam. Australia is often a hot, dusty shithole. <sighs> It's how we roll. Fitting a snorkel raises the air intake to allow the air to be taken from a higher, cooler location that in most cases is less affected by dust. Okay, so as I see it, there are three claims here, higher, cooler, and cleaner. Snorkels are definitely higher, so hey, we agree on that, and that's always a nice place to start. But on the other two, not so much. Cooler, okay? So which car ran this image right there to support these claims. We're talking about waist height versus chrome dome height. Standard 4x4 air intakes are about waist high. Snorkels are near the chrome on the dome that the chicks can't leave alone, aren't they? And then of course you wake up and you see your father looking back at you in the mirror, disconcertingly. Seconds after that, of course, reality frigging bites, doesn't it? Let us run a thought experiment on this anyway. Imagine yourself out there enjoying the ambience of Dingo Piss Creek, nude 
one day, as you do. Midday in summer, just you and the flies and the ants and the snakes and the dingoes. You're standing there all alone except for the pests in nature, nude, living the damn dream. <laughs> Ask yourself, dude, in this rapturous state, does the air around your beer gut actually feel that much warmer than the air around your chrome dome? Really? Like, does it? Is it a profound difference? I mean, I could see the air just above the road's surface being affected by convection off the road on a still day, but only for a few inches. And let's not forget, if you fit a snorkel, you're going to suck that air subsequently through a metal or black plastic tube, aren't you? And it's basically just sitting there, that snorkel, baking in the sun continuously. So it's going to be what? 70 degrees C or something, certainly hotter than 60. You won't be able to keep your hand on it. That's usually about that sort of ballpark. And of course, if the wind is blowing or if you're following a vehicle in front, the air is going to be all mixed up and these height-based temperature gradients just won't exist at all, will they? So to me, that just seems like a somewhat bullshit claim about cooler. Like, really? I suppose I could be quite wrong here, but I'm not seeing it. As for less dust, okay, if we refer back to the image helpfully placed there by which car to assist snorkel buyers to part with their fat stacks of cash, I have to say the standard air intake location and the snorkel intake, they both seem equally bereft of dust to me and that looks like a pretty friggin' dusty road, dude. And of course, if you were driving metaphorically right up the bottom of a vehicle in front of you on a road such as this, your entire off-road shitbox would be more or less equally enveloped in dust. So I'm not convinced on air cleanliness being improved by snorkelization. I frankly don't see much evidence for these claims about cooler and cleaner air. However, this did not stop which car from concluding this. Engines require cooler, cleaner air to work to their optimum ability, so having an elevated snorkel filtering air into the engine when attempting to mount Big Red will make it a hell of a lot easier to reach the top. Okay, so striving for consensus once again, that first bit is almost correct about engine performance depending on cool air. Cooler air certainly is better, all other things being equal. But Snorkels typically don't filter air, dudes. They just suck. Cleaner air doesn't really affect engine performance either because inlet air is filtered and as long as you service the filter appropriately, engine performance is going to remain unaffected by dust. Plus, there's no evidence that I can see for snorkels reliably delivering air that is significantly cleaner or cooler in most operating scenarios. And I've driven down a shitload of dirt roads too, so I've sucked a hell of a lot of dust in hot places. Upliftingly. Big Red is, of course, my somewhat affectionate nickname for Tiffany at the office. Such fond memories there. Vivid ones. Big Red in Technicolor. Yes. But, of course, that's just me. Big Red is also more commonly a godforsaken 40 metre high pile of sand on the eastern edge of a proud Schittsvillian wasteland called Homer Simpson's Desert. You should go there and never come back, dude. Peak hour traffic problem solved. And hey, you're welcome. To Tristan Tancredi, who wrote this interesting report in Which Car, I'd suggest... <sighs> Bad example, dude. Snorkels have only one undisputable benefit, okay, which is protecting the engine from over-the-bonnet water crossings. You're unlikely to find one of those when you are, quote, attempting to mount Big Red. <sighs> I'm pretty sure there's a joke there about needing a snorkel while attempting to mount Big Red, if you think about it. However, I absolutely will not sully a fine show such as this with a crass joke such as that.
snorkel sellers do love to lube up and discuss increased airflow, like Roger Ramjet's air effect or something, hero of our nation. They just love it, those dudes. The proton energy pill of snorkelization when you don't have a nearby river to cross, I suppose. In the witch car suck piece, personal opinion, Jason Luxon, the marketing manager for the popular Safari snorkel brand, offered this in relation to Safari's Armax snorkel models, in addition to the usual cooler, cleaner claims. Armax snorkel systems go one step further and have the ability to supply up to 40% more airflow over a standard air intake system for increased engine performance. Let's not forget that up to 40% also includes zero improvement or even a net reduction. Like, it just means not more than 40%. So there's that. But let us be clear on claims such as this, okay? These kinds of statements are often presented so that the hapless punter out there focuses on the number rather than any weasel word caveats. The punter hears up to 40%, but they actually compute 40%. And I have to say that engines are generally limited by airflow, like, after all, the only thing a turbo actually adds to an engine is additional air. So, if you could magically jam in 40% more air at highway speeds, that would be just like a turbocharger. And it would be friggin' awesome because, hey, a whole lot cheaper, you could do it in the driveway at home. Unfortunately, you know, you're also adding more than a metre of plumbing and you're asking the air to change direction through a total of about... 270 odd degrees of total flow rotation and most of the snorkel plumbing is effectively a convective heater if you're driving down the road on a sunny day so there's that and air is a viscous fluid let's not forget so it really doesn't like flowing fast through a tube there are frictional forces against the straight bits and especially the bendy bits and nor does this air enjoy turning corners so there's that like it's got momentum dude Problematically, there are side-facing intakes and forward-facing intakes and even rear-facing intakes on popular snorkels, and they all seem to perform about the same, which is kind of interesting to me, because the rear and side-facing ones simply are not getting much Roger Ramjet effect, are they? And let's not forget that engines typically don't need a remap when you fit a snorkel, so there's hardly a profound change in airflow actually afoot. And believe me, if you were adding 40% more air, they probably would need a friggin' retune. And the stock injectors might not be able to keep up during high-speed overtaking manoeuvres if airflow were increased by 40% during periods of high demand and at high reps. And we haven't really changed the turbo or the intercooler when we fit a snorkel, have we? And that kind of mitigates rather a lot of what you do upstream with airflow in any case. So, dude, I really don't see a great flow increase into the engine from fitting a snorkel. I just don't. Although the designers would have done a fine job, in my view, if they had just managed not to restrict the airflow any further at all. If you actually plan on doing the whole hunt for Red October thing in your fine 4x4 wanking chariot, knock yourself out, dude. Fit a snorkel and make sure they do a really, really good job sealing it in all the joints because a hydro lock is not fun. Except, of course, if it happens to someone else and you manage to see it. And do not forget the engine fan, okay, which is designed to suck air and which can easily drag itself into the radiator if it sucks water. If you've ever wondered how to make a radiator core smoothie, that's essentially the recipe. And don't forget the friggin' breathers either, so often overlooked. See, you can't actually seal gearboxes or transfer cases or diffs. Like, air seal them, okay? If you did, they would pump oil out past the seals every time they heat up, and over time, that's bad. So they've got these vents, which are called breathers, that allow air pressure inside the case to equalise with outside, which is a fantastic idea until you park your vehicle deep in Dingo Piss Creek. 
And when that happens, the breathers start to suck because the components cool rapidly and so does the air inside, which shrinks. Thus, they suck water into the case, which gets churned by the gears and emulsifies with the oil. <sighs> On the plus side of all of that, it turns into a beautiful, elegant cappuccino colour. <laughs> On the minus side, though, that emulsion doesn't actually lubricate the expensive internal parts all that well. So you'd also want to extend the breathers if you want to cross deep water and increase the oil change frequency, not the duration that it's in there. Increase the frequency of the friggin' changes for those major driveline components if you do the whole deep water thing. And hey, caveat emptor, right? Like do it at your own risk. That's the conclusion for hardcore deep water off-road nut jobs. But I do note, upliftingly, that there are many more snorkels out there in traffic than there are 4x4s doing the James Bond Lotus Esprit bit from all those years ago, right? And I get it, generalising terribly here, but a man bolting on a snorkel to his fine 4x4 W chariot is roughly the same thing as a woman spending three hours inside a Dior boutique before walking out with the same handbag as Lady Di. You can convince yourself you're getting better performance and cleaner, cooler air, whatever, plus, I guess, it prevents baldness and helps stop atherosclerosis. <laughs> whatever that is. It sounds bad, though, doesn't it? But all of that, it's just confirmation bias. Dude, it's not real. In fact, overwhelmingly, for most people who fit one, a snorkel is nothing more than a fashion accessory, you know, like blunnies and a snorkel. Who hasn't wanted to see that under the friggin' Christmas tree? It sounds pretty good to me. Face facts, dude. You probably don't need a snorkel even if you actually visit Dingo Piss Flat. But it's kind of nice to have one and you'll fit in with all the other dudes there. You set up your campsite while the sun sets majestically and the uniquely sulfurous, ammoniated odour of eons of dingo dens. You know, that rich history just rises up. <sighs> Mozzie traffic control commences IFR flight ops just as you open your very last lukewarm beer of Foster's. <laughs> Life doesn't get any better than this. Except, of course, in a suite at the Hyatt. <laughs> Out there in the wilderness, dude, just a man and his snorkel staring into the fire and fantasising one day about once again mounting Big Red. 